Eros and Civilization: A Physical Inquiry into Freud, by Herbert Marcuse. This is the two prefaces and the introduction. Political Preface, nineteen sixty-six. Eros and Civilization. The title expressed an optimistic, euphemistic, even positive thought, namely that the achievements of advanced industrial society would enable man to reverse the direction of progress. To break the fatal union of productivity and destruction, liberty and repression, in other words, to learn the gay science of how to use the social wealth for shaping man's world in accordance with his life instincts, in the concerted struggle against the purveyors of death. This optimism was based on the assumption that the rationale for the continued acceptance of domination no longer prevailed. That scarcity and the need for toil were only artificially perpetuated, in the interest of, of preserving the system of domination. I neglected or minimized the fact that this obsolescent rationale had been vastly strengthened, if not replaced, by even more efficient forms of social control. The very forces which rendered society capable of pacif pacifying the struggle for existence. Serve to repress in the individuals the need for such a liberation, where the high standard of living does not suffice for reconciling the people with their life and their rulers, the social engineering of the soul and the science of human relations provide the necessary libidinal catharsis. In the in the affluent society, the authorities are hardly forced to justify their dominion. They deliver the goods. They satisfy the sexual and the aggressive energy of their subjects, like the unconscious, the destructive power of which they so successfully represent. They are this side of good and evil, and the principle of contradiction has no place in their logic. As the affluence of society depends increasingly on the uninterrupted production and consumption of waste, gadgets, planned obsolescence, and means of destruction. The individuals have to be adapted to these requirements in more than the traditional ways. The economic whip, even in its most refined forms, seems no longer adequate to ensure the continuation of the struggle for existence in today's outdated organization. Nor do the laws and patriotism seem adequate to ensure active popular support for the ever more dangerous expansion of the system. Scientific management of instinctual needs has long since become a vital factor in the reproduction of the system. Merchandise, which has to be bought and used, is made into objects of the libido, and the national enemy, who has to be fought and hated, is distorted and inflated to such an extent that he can activate and satisfy aggressiveness in the depth dimension of the unconscious. Mass democracy provides the political paraphernalia for effectuating this introjection of the reality principle. It not only permits the people, up to a point, to choose their own masters and to participate, up to a point, in the government which governs them. It also allows the masters to disappear behind the technological veil of the productive and destructive apparatus, which they control. And it congeals the human and material costs of the benefits and comforts, which it bestows upon those who collaborate. The people efficiently, or the people efficiently manipulated or organized, are free. Ignorance and impotence interjected heteronomy heter heter is the price of their freedom. It makes no sense to talk about liberation to free men. And we are free if we do not belong to the oppressed minority, and it makes no sense to talk about surplus repression when men and women enjoy more sexual liberty than ever before. But the truth is that this freedom and satisfaction are transforming the earth into hell. The inferno is still concentrated in certain faraway places: Vietnam, the Congo, South Africa, and in the ghettos of the affluent society. In Mississippi, in Alabama, in Harlem, these infernal places illuminate the whole. It is easy and sensible to see in them only pockets of poverty and misery in a growing society, capable of eliminating them gradually and without and without a catastrophe. This interpretation may even be realistic and correct. The question is: eliminated at what cost? 
not in dollars and cents, but in human lives and in human freedom. I hesitate to use the word freedom because it is precisely in the name of freedom that crimes against humanity are being perpetrated. This situation is certainly not new in history. Poverty and exploitation were products of economic freedom. Time and again, people were liberated all over the globe by their lords and masters, and their new liberty turned out to be submission, not to the rule of law, but to the rule of the law of, other, of the others. What started as subjection by force soon became voluntary servitude, collaboration in reproducing the society, which made servitude increasingly rewarding and palatable. The reproduction, bigger and better, of the same ways of life came to mean ever more clearly and consciously the closing of those other possible ways of life, which could do away with the serfs and the masters, with the productivity of repression. Today, this union of freedom and servitude has become natural and a vehicle of progress. Prosperity appears more and more as the prerequisite and byproduct of a self-propelling productivity, ever seeking new outlets for consumption and for destruction, in outer and inner space, while being restrained from overflowing into the areas of misery, at home and abroad, as against this amalgam of liberty and aggression, production and destruction, the image of human freedom is dislocated. It becomes the project of the subversion of this sort of progress. Liberation of the instinctual needs for peace and quiet of the asocial autonomous eros presupposes liberation from repressive affluence, a reversal in the direction of progress. It was the thesis of Eros and Civilization, more fully developed in my own in my one-dimensional man, that man could avoid the fate of a welfare through warfare state only by achieving a new starting point where he could reconstruct the, pro uh, the productive apparatus without that inner worldly asceticism, which provided the mental basis for domination and exploration. This image of man was the determinant negation of Nietzsche's Superman, man intelligent enough and healthy enough to dispense with all heroes and heroic vir virtues, man without the impulse to live dangerously, to meet the challenge, man with a good conscience, to make life an end in itself, to live in joy a life without fear. Polymorphous sexuality was the term which I used to indicate that the new direction of progress would depend completely on the opportunity to activate repressed or arrested organic biological needs, to make the human body an instrument of pleasure rather than labor. The old formula, the development of prevailing needs and faculties, seemed to be inadequate. The emergence of new, qualitatively different needs and faculties seemed to be the prerequisite, the content of liberation. The idea of such a new reality principle was based on the assumption that the material technical preconditions for its development were either established or could be established in the advanced industrial societies of our time. It was, the self under it was self understood that the translation of technical capabilities into reality would mean a revolution, but the very scope and effectiveness of the democratic introjection have suppressed the historical subject, the agent of revolution. Free people are not in need of liberation, and the oppressed are not strong enough to liberate themselves. These conditions redefine the concept of utopia. Liberation is the more realistic, or the most realistic, the most concrete of all historical possibilities, and at the same time the most rationally and effectively repressed, the most abstract and remote possibility. No philosophy, no theory can undo the democratic introjection of the masters into their subjects. When in the more or less affluent societies, productivity has reached a level at which the masses participate in its benefit and at which the opposition is effectively and democratically contained, then the conflict between master and slave is also effectively contained, or rather it has changed its social location. It exists and explodes in the revolt of the backward countries against the intolerable heritage of colonialism and its prolongation by neo-colonialism. The Marxian concept stipulated that only those who were free from the blessings of capitalism could possibly change it into a free society. Those whose existence was the very negation of capitalist property 
could become the historical agents of liberation. In the international arena, the Marxian concept regains its full validity. To the degree to which the exploitative societies have become global powers, to the degree to which the new independent nations have become the battlefield of their interests, the external forces of rebellion have ceased to be extraneous forces. They are the enemy within the system. This does not make these rebels the messengers of humanity. By themselves, they are not, as little as the Marxian proletariat was, the representatives of freedom. Here, too, the Marxian concept applies according to which the international proletariat would get its intellectual armor from outside. The lightning of thought would strike the Neven Volksboden. Grandiose ideas about the union of theory and practice do injustice to the feeble beginnings of such a union. Yet the revolt in the backward countries has found a response in the advanced countries, where youth is in protest against repression and affluence in war abroad. Revolt against the false fathers, teachers, and heroes. Solidarity with the wretched of the earth. Is there any organic connection between the two facets of the protest? There seems to be an all but instinctual solidarity. The revolt at home against home seems, oops, seems largely impulsive. Its targets hard to define. Nausea caused by the way of life, revolt is a matter of physical and mental hygiene. The body against the machine, not against the mechanism constructed to make life safer and milder, to attenuate the cruelty of nature, but against the machine which has taken over the mechanism. The political machine, the corporate machine, the cultural and educational machine, which has welded blessing and curse into one rational whole. The whole has become too big, its cohesion too strong, its functioning too efficient. Does the power of the negative concentrate in still partly unconquered primitive elemental forces? Um, the body against the machine, men, women, and children fighting with the most primitive tools, the most brutal and destructive machine of all times, and keeping in check. Does guerrilla warfare define the revolution of our time? Historical backwardness may again become the historical chance of turning the wheel of progress to another direction. Technical and scientific overdevelopment stands refuted when the radar-equipped bombers, the chemicals, and the special forces of the affluent society are let loose on the poorest of the earth, on their shacks, hospitals, and rice fields. The accidents reveal the substance. They tear the technological veil behind which the real powers are hiding. The capability to overkill and to overburn and the mental behavior that goes with it are byproducts of the development of the productive forces within a system of exploitation and repression. They seem to become more productive the more comfortable the system becomes to its privileged subjects. The affluent society has now demonstrated that it is a society at war. If its citizens have not noticed it, its victims, are cer its victims certainly have. The historical advantage of the latecomer of technical backwardness may be that of skipping the stage of the affluent society. Backward peoples, by their poverty and weakness, may be forced to forego the aggressive and wasteful use of science and technology to keep the productive apparatus à la mesure de l'homme under his control for the satisfaction and development of vital individual collective needs. For the, under, for the overdeveloped countries, this chance would be tantamount to the abolition of the conditions under which man's labor perpetuates, as self-propelling power, his subordination to the productive apparatus, and with it the obsolete forms of the struggle for existence. The abolition of these forms is, just as, just as it has always been, the task of political action, but there is a decisive difference in the present situation. Whereas previous revolutions brought about a larger and more rational development of the productive forces, in the overdeveloped societies of today, revolution would mean reversal of this trend, elimination of overdevelopment and of its repressive rationality. The rejection of affluent productivity far from being a commitment to purity, simplicity, and nature, might be the token and weapon of a higher stage of human development, based on the achievements of the technological society. As the production of wasteful and destructive goods is discontinued, 
a stage which would mean the end of capitalism in all its forms. The somatic and mental mutilations inflicted on man by this production may be undone. In other words, the shaping of the environment, the transformation of nature, may be propelled by the liberated rather than the repressed life instincts, and aggression would be subjected to their demands. The historical chance of the backward countries is in the absence of conditions which make for repressive exploitative technology and, in, and industrialization for aggressive productivity. The very fact that the affluent warfare state unleashes its, an, its anni annihilating power on the backward countries illuminates the magnitude of the threat. In the revolt of the backward peoples, the rich societies meet in an elemental and brutal form, not only a social revolt in the traditional sense, but also an instinctual revolt, biological hatred. The spread of guerrilla warfare at the height of the technological century is a symbolic event. The energy of the human body rebels against intolerable repression and throws itself against the engines of repression. Perhaps the rebels know nothing about the ways of organizing a society, of constructing a socialist society. Perhaps they are terrorized by their own leaders who know something about it. But the rebels' frightful existence is in total need of liberation, and their freedom is the contradiction to the overdeveloped societies. Western civilization has always glorified the hero, the sacrifice of life for the city, the state, the nation. It is rarely asked the question of whether the established city, state, nation were worth the sacrifice. The taboo on the unquestionable prerogative of the whole has always been maintained and enforced, and it has been maintained and enforced the more brutally the more the whole was supposed to consist of free individuals. The question is now being asked, asked from without, and it is taken up by those who refuse to play the game of the affluence. The question of whether the abolition of this whole is not the precondition for the emergence of a truly human city-state nation. The odds are overwhelmingly on the side of the powers that be. What is romantic is not the positive evaluation of the liberation movements in the backward countries, but the positive evaluation of their prospects. There is no reason why science, technology, and money should not again do the job of destruction and then the job of reconstruction in their own image. The price of progress is frightfully high, but we shall overcome. Not only the deceived victims, but also their chief of state have said so. And yet there are photographs that show a row of half-naked corpses laid out for the victors in Vietnam. They resemble in all details the pictures of the starved, emasculated corpses of Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Nothing and nobody can ever overcome these deeds, nor the sense of guilt which reacts in further aggression. But aggression can be turned against the aggressor. The strange myth according to which the unhealing wound can only be healed by the weapon that afflicted the wound has not yet been validated in history. The violence which breaks the chain of violence may start a new chain. And yet, in and against this continuum, the fight will continue. It is not the struggle of Eros against Thanatos, because the established society too has its Eros. It protects, perpetuates, and enlarges life. And it is not a bad life for those who comply and repress. But in the balance, the general presumption is that aggressiveness in defense of life is less detrimental to the life instincts than aggressiveness in aggression. In defense of life, the phrase has explosive meaning in the affluent society. It involves not only the protest against neo-colonial war and slaughter, the burning of draft cards at the risk of prison, the fight for civil rights, but also the refusal to speak the dead language of affluence, to wear the clean clothes, to enjoy the gadgets of affluence, to go through the education for affluence. The new bohem, the beatniks and hipsters, the peace creeps, all these decadents now have become what decadence probably always was, poor refuge of defamed humanity. Can we speak of a juncture between the erotic and political dimension? In and against the deadly efficient organization of the affluent society, not only radical protest, but even the attempt to formulate, to articulate, to give word to protest assume a childlike, ridiculous immaturity. Thus, it is ridiculous and perhaps logical that the free speech movement at Berkeley terminated in the row 
caused by the appearance of a sign with the four-letter word. It is perhaps equally ridiculous and right to see deeper significance in the buttons worn by some of the demonstrators, among them infants, against the slaughter in Vietnam, make love, not war. On the other side, against the new youth who refuse and rebel are the representatives of the old order, who can no longer protect its life without sacrificing it in the work of destruction and waste and pollution. They now include the representatives of organized labor, correctly so to the extent to which employment within the capitalist prosperity depends on the continued defense of the established social system. Can the outcome for the near future be in doubt? The people, the majority of the people in the affluent society are on the side of that which is, not that which can and ought to be. And the established order is strongly enough, strong enough and efficient enough to justify this adherence and to assure its continuation. However, the very strength and efficiency of this order may become factors of disintegration, perpetuation of the obsolescent need for full-time labor, even in a very reduced form, will require the increasing waste of resources, the creation of ever more unnecessary jobs and services, and the growth of the military or destructive sector. Escalated wars, permanent preparation for war, and total administration may well suffice to keep the people under control, but at the cost of altering the morality on which the society still depends. Technical progress, itself a necessity for the maintenance of the established society, fosters needs and faculties which are antagonistic to the social organization of labor on which the system is built. In the course of automation, the value of the social product is to an increasingly smaller degree determined by the labor time necessary for its production. Consequently, the real social need for productive labor declines and the vacuum must be filled with unproductive activities. An ever larger amount of the work actually performed becomes superfluous, expendable, meaningless. Although these activities can be sustained and even multiplied under total administration, there seems to exist an upper limit to their augmentation. This limit would be reached when the surplus value created by productive labor no longer suffices to pay for non-production work. A progressive reduction of labor seems to be inevitable, and for this eventuality, the system has to provide for occupation without work. It has to develop needs which transcend the market economy and may even be incompatible with it. The affluent society is in its own way preparing for this eventuality by organizing the desire for beauty and the hunger for community, the renewal of the contact with nature, the enrichment of the mind and honors for cre creation for its own sake. The false ring of such proclamations is indicative of the fact that within the established system, these aspirations are translated into administered cultural activities sponsored by the government and the big corporations, an extension of their executive arm into the soul of the masses. It is all but impossible to recognize in the aspirations thus defined those of Eros and its autonomous transformation of a repressive environment and a repressive existence. If these goals are to be satisfied without irre irreconcilable conflict with the requirements of the market economy, they must be satisfied within the framework of commerce and profit. But this sort of sat satisfaction would be tantamount to denial, for the erotic energy of the life instincts cannot be freed under the dehumanizing conditions of profitable affluence. To be sure, the conflict between the necessary development of non-economic needs, which would validate the idea of the abolition of labor, life as an end in itself, on the one hand, and the necessity for maintaining the need for earning a living on the other is quite manageable, especially as long as the enemy within and without can serve as propelling force behind the defense of the status quo. However, the conflict may become explosive if it is accompanied and aggravated by the prospective changes at the very base of advanced industrial society, namely the gradual undermining of capitalist enterprise in the course of automation. In the meantime, there are things to be done. The system has its weakest point where it shows its most brutal strength in the escalation of its military potential, which seems to press for periodic actualization with ever shorter interruptions of peace and preparedness. This tendency seems reversible only under strongest pressure, and its reversal would open the danger spots in the social structure 
Its conversion into a normal capitalist system is hardly imaginable without a serious crisis and sweeping economic and political changes. Today, the opposition to war and military intervention strikes at the roots. It rebels against those whose economic and political dominion depends on the continued and enlarged reproduction of the military establishment, its multipliers, and the policies which necessitate this reproduction. These interests are not hard to identify, and the war against them does not require missiles, bombs, and napalm. But it does require something that is much harder to produce. The spread of uncensored and unmanipulated knowledge, consciousness, and above all, the organized refusal to continue work on the material and intellectual instruments which are now being used against man for the defense of the liberty and prosperity of those who dominate the rest. To the degree to which organized labor operates in defense of the status quo and to the degree to which the share of labor in the material process of production declines, intellectual skills and capabilities become social and political factors. Today, the organized refusal to cooperate of the scientists mathematicians, technicians, industrial psychologists, and public opinion pollsters may well accomplish what a strike, even a large-scale strike, can no longer accomplish. But once, established, once accomplished, namely the beginning of the reversal, the preparation of the ground for political action, that the idea appears utterly unrealistic, does not reduce the political responsibility involved in the position and function of the intellectual and contemporary industrial society. The intellectual refusal may find support in another catalyst, the instinctual refusal among the youth in protest. It is their lives which are at stake, and if not their lives, their mental health and their capacity to function as unmutilated humans. Their protest will continue because it is a biological necessity. By nature, the young are in the forefront of those who live and fight for Eros against death and against a civilization which strives to shorten the detour to death while controlling the means for lengthening the detour. But in the administered society, the biological necessity does not immediately issue an action. Organization demands counter-organization. Today, the fight for life, the fight for Eros, is the political fight. Uh, preface to the first edition. This essay employs psychological categories because they have become political categories. The, tradi the traditional borderlines between psychology on the one side and political and social philosophy on the other have been made obsolete by the condition of man in the present era. Formerly, autonomous and identifiable psychical processes are being absorbed by the function of the individual in the state, by his public existence. Psychological problems, therefore, turn into political problems. Private disorder d reflects more directly than before the disorder of the whole, and the cure of personal disorder depends more directly than before on the cure of the general disorder. The era tends to be totalitarian, even where it has not produced totalitarian states. Psychology could be elaborated and practiced as a special discipline as long as the psyche could sustain itself against the public power, as long as privacy was real, really desired, and self-shaped. If the individual has neither the ability nor the possibility to be for himself, the terms of psychology become the terms of the societal forces which define the psyche. Under these circumstances, applying psychology in the analysis of social and political events means taking an approach which has been vitiated by these very events. The task is rather the opposite, to develop the political and sociological substance of the psychological notions. I have tried to reformulate certain basic questions and to follow them in a direction not yet fully explored. I am aware of the tentative character of this inquiry and hope to discuss some of the problems, especially those of an aesthetic theory, more adequately in the near future. The ideas developed in this book were first presented in a series of lectures at the Washington School of Psychiatry in 1950 to 51. I wish to thank Mr. Joseph Borkin of Washington who encouraged me to write this book. I am deeply grateful to Professors Clyde Clocone and Barrington Moore Jr. of Harvard University and to Drs. Henry and Yella Lauenfeld of New York, who have read the manuscript and offered valuable suggestions and criticism. For the content of this essay, I take the sole responsibility. 
As to my theoretical position, I am indebted to my friend, Professor Max Horkheimer, and to his collaborators at the Institute of Social, Re Social Research, now in Frankfurt. Introduction. Sigmund Freud's proposition that civilization is based on the permanent subjugation of the human instincts has been taken for granted. His question whether the suffering thereby inflicted upon individuals has been worth the benefits of culture has not, has not been taken too seriously, the less so since Freud himself considered the process to be inevitable and irreversible. Free gratification of man's instinctual needs is incompatible with civilized society. Renunciation and delay in satisfaction are the prerequisites of progress. Happiness, said Freud, is no cultural value. Happiness must be subordinated to the discipline of work as full-time occupation, to the discipline of mon monogamic reproduction, to the established system of law and order. The methodo methodical sacrifice of libido, its rigidly enforced deflection to socially useful activities and expressions, is culture. The sacrifice has paid off well. In the technically advanced areas of, of civilization, the conquest of nature is practically complete, and more needs of a greater number of people are fulfilled than ever before. Neither the mechanization and standardization of life, nor the mental impoverishment, nor the growing destructiveness of present-day progress provides sufficient ground for questioning the principle which has governed the progress of Western civilization. The continual increase of productivity makes constantly more realistic the promise of an even better life for all. However intensified, progress seems to be bound up with intensified unfreedom. Throughout the world of industrial civilization, the domination of man by man is growing in scope and efficiency. Nor does this trend appear as an incident, incidental transitory regression on the road to progress. Concentration camps, mass exterminations, world wars, and atom bombs are no relapse into barbarism, but the unrepressed implementation of the achievements of modern science, technology, and domination. And the most effective subjugation and destruction of man by man takes place at the height of civilization when the material and intellectual attainments of mankind seem to allow the creation of a truly free world. These negative aspects of present-day culture may well indicate the obsolescence of established institutions and the emergence of new forms of civilization. Repressiveness is perhaps the more vigorously maintained, the more unnecessary it becomes. If it must indeed belong to the essence of civilization as such, then Freud's question as to the price of civilization would be meaningless, for there would be no alternative. But Freud's own theory provides reasons for rejecting his identification of civilization with repression. On the ground of his own theoretical achievements, the discussion of the problem must be reopened. Does the interrelation between freedom and repression, productivity and destruction, domination and progress, really constitute the principle of civilization? Or does, or does this interrelation result only from a specific historical organization of human existence? In Freudian terms, is the conflict between pleasure principle and reality principle irreconcilable to such a degree that it necess necessitates the repressive transformation of man's instinctual structure? Or does it allow the concept of a non-repressive civilization based on a fundamentally different experience of being, a fundamental different a fundamentally different relation between man and nature, and fundamentally different ex existential relations. The notion of a non-repressive civilization will be discussed not as an abstract and utopian speculation. We believe that the discussion is justified on two concrete and realistic grounds. First, Freud's theoretical conception itself seems to refute his consistent denial of the historical possibility of a non-repressive civilization. And second, the very achievements of repressive civilization seem to create the preconditions for the gradual abolition of repression. To elucidate these grounds, we shall try to reinterpret Freud's theoretical conception in terms of its own socio-historical content. This procedure implies opposition to the revisionist neo-Freudian schools. In contrast to the revisionists, I believe that Freud's theory is in its very substance sociological, and that no new cultural or sociological orientation is needed to reveal this substance. 
Freud's biologism is social theory in a in a depth dimension that has been consistently flattened out by the neo-Freudian schools. In shifting the emphasis from the unconscious to the conscious, from the biological to the cultural factors, they cut off the roots of society and the instincts and instead take society at the level on which it confronts the individual as his ready-made environment, without questioning its origin and legitimacy. The neo-Freudian analysis of this environment thus succumbs to the mystification of societal relations and their critique moves only within the firmly sanctioned and well-protected sphere of established institutions. Consequently, the neo-Freudian critique remains in a strict sense ideological. It has no conceptual basis outside the established system. Most of its critical ideas and values are those provided by the system. Idealistic morality and religion celebrate their happy resurrection. The fact that they are embellished with the vocabulary of the very psychology that originally refuted their claim ill conceals their identity with officially desired and advertised attitudes. Moreover, we believe that the most concrete insights into the historical structure of civilization are contained precisely in the concepts that the revisionists reject. Almost the entire Freudian meta metapsycholo metapsychology, his late theory of the instincts, his reconstruction of the prehistory of mankind belonged to these concepts. Freud himself treated them as mere working hypotheses, helpful in elucidating certain obscurities, in establishing, fuck, in establishing <coughs> uh, tentative links between theoretical, th theoretically unconnected insights, always open to correction and to be discarded if they no longer facilitated the progress of psychoanalytic theory and practice. In the post-Freudian post development of psychoanalysis, this metapsychology has been almost entirely eliminated. As psychoanalysis has become socially and scientifically respectable, it has freed itself from, com from compromising speculations. Compromising they were, indeed, in more than one sense. Not only did they transcend the realm of clinical observation and therapeutic usefulness, but also they interpreted man in terms far more offensive to social taboos than Freud's earlier pansexualism, terms that reveal the explosive basis of civilization. The subsequent discussion will try to apply the tabooed insights of psychoanalysis, tabooed even in psychoanalysis itself, to an interpretation of the basic trends of civilization. The purpose of this essay is to contribute to the philosophy of psychoanalysis, not to psychoan psychoanalysis itself. It moves exclusively in the field of theory, and it keeps outside the technical discipline which psychoanalysis has become. Freud developed a theory of man, a psychology in the strict sense. With this theory, Freud placed himself in the great tradition of philosophy and under philosophical criteria. Our concern is not with a corrected or improved interpretation of Freudian concepts, but with their philosophical and sociological implications. Freud conscientiously distinguished his philosophy from his science. The Neo-Freudians have denied most of the former. On therapeutic grounds, such a denial may be perfectly justified. However, no therapeutic argument should hamper the development of a theoretical construction which aims not at curing individual sickness, but at diagnosing the general disorder. A few preliminary explanations of terms are necessary. Civilization is used interchangeably with culture, as in Freud's civilization and its discontents. Repression and repressive are used in the non-technical sense to designate both conscious and unconscious, external and internal processes of restraint, constraint, and suppression. Instinct, in accordance with Freud's notion of Trieb, refers to primary drives of the human organism, which are subject to historical modification. They find mental as well as somatic representation. <laughs>